So I'm involved in a project called the Immersive Tools Project. And I started working on this because um, there was a, uh, there's a program at uh, Berkeley, which is in the Institute for Arts Education and Special Needs. And that institute grew out of a long-standing program that was at the Boston Conservatory, uh, which was connected to their graduate program in music education and autism. And then a couple years ago, the Boston Conservatory and Berklee College of Music merged. And so one of the things, and I've been at, at Berkeley for 17 years now, and one of the things that we were very fortunate to have uh, part of, become part of Berkeley is that program and that concentration in autism. So when we first, when I was looking at projects uh, to think about what could I do to, well, help people with virtual reality, extended reality, augmented reality, what are some of the kinds of projects um, uh, in uh, sort of excess of games, uh, serious games, what are the kinds of applications that could be um, of, you know, of help for people in the world. One of the areas I was really excited about was this project and uh, to work with some of the people in that graduate program. And I have a personal angle in, uh, involved in this as well because one of my children is on the autism spectrum and he also takes music lessons in the program that uh, th these tools are, in, are uh, addressed to. Although he started taking lessons in the program after I had become involved in this project. So the program is on Saturday mornings and there are students, not necessarily college students, but students from the greater Boston community who come from pretty young, well, some of them are sort of four or five years old, and there's some group like music making classes, and then they go all the way up to adults. And so it's a chance for some of the, the students, the graduate students, to work with uh, people, have students in for private lessons, and then also some of the graduates and then some of the faculty in that program as well, in, in that department. So all around, it's been an amazing and very quick growing uh, program where there have been uh, many, many benefits beyond what uh, people had originally hoped, of course, you know, as often happens with special needs and arts, where there are the possibilities for um, the specific population to have teachers and an environment that can best help them blossom in terms of any talent or interest that they have in that particular art, in this case, different music uh, instruments. And now it's expanding because of uh, just widening out with uh, the, the larger umbrella of this you know, Institute for Arts Education and Special Needs. It's, uh, it's widening out in a couple directions, one to include dance and movement, and then also to include uh, other, um, uh, other needs in, in addition to autism, so anxiety and visual impairment. So, at, excuse me, so as, as this has blossomed out and um, you know, become a larger, more uh, exciting uh, community and an exciting program, it's also gotten bigger, <laughs> of course, right? And we have multiple classes, multiple lessons, the conservatory building that the lessons and the programs take place in on Saturday morning is really exciting. It becomes a place where parents um, are able to meet each other and talk to each other, and uh, the teachers are able to get to know each other, and the children um, become, and the children and the adults, you know, the young adults and some adults, become uh, just so much more confident about their um, abilities in music. But then, of course, there are other abilities as well. They, um, uh, in terms of the, the students with, um, on the autism spectrum, they often become more communicative with their teachers and that relationship is so important and becomes a real place of trust and um, uh, trust and, uh, and, and um, well, let's leave it at trust for right now and then we'll go into some other things as well. So, as we were approaching this project, we used the, the 
process of design thinking, which um, made famous by the Stanford D School, where the designers first empathize with the, and, and think about who is going to be using this thing that I'm making, whether it's an object or a game or a tool, what, uh, whatever it is, an interface. Then, uh, and I like this, this uh, picture that's up here actually quite a bit because even though it's an older uh, graphic from the D school, I like the way the arrows go out and then they go in and then they go out again and then they go around and you know I think that that's a, a really uh, a nice it's a nice uh, uh, image that they have and first to empathize for designers and of course this is a, a really important part of working on any kind of tool for um, for ASD because it's the idea of creating something that is going to be helpful for and useful for someone who, if you are a neurotypical designer, uh, for someone who is not understanding, processing, and experiencing the world in the same way that you are, and most importantly, in not in the same way that the whole world is set up for. right? So how did we get a group of people who aren't necessarily thinking about that to think well, you know, what, what does that mean? Then to define our tools, then to create lots of different ideas. We're really, it's still in the prototyping stage now, and now we're starting to get feedback with um, bringing the tools to our students. And, and also, one of the things we realized during this process is that the, the teachers were as much our group of users as uh, the students that we were hoping that, well, that, that they'll be using them with, which was, was sort of an interesting thing. At first, I was thinking, oh, you know, these, these are the tools, these are the tools for, for uh, the students, the music students, and this is, what, this is what they need. This is what we think they need. This is what the research, you know, my research suggests that we need. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about our team right here. So um, it, it's me, which, you know, that's me, right? <laughs> and then uh, Dr. Rhoda Bernard, who's been working um, in music and autism, music education and autism for uh, a long time now and has just done such pioneering work. She's such a, like a gen and, and gentle and incredibly energetic person. She started that Music and Autism Saturday morning lesson program by herself and believed in it, didn't have a lot of resources at first, made it happen and uh, has, has done, has watched it become uh, this institute and there was a big opening Berkeley style where we had, uh, you know, like a wonderful uh, party and music and a reception and uh, it was a real wonderful moment for her to have all of that kind of you know be, be there and be recognized and blossom into this this new level of, um, of a program with a lot of good support and then we have a student team so we have three graduate students in uh, the music education and autism program and all three of them are uh, teachers public school teachers in Boston or right around Boston, music teachers, music uh, um, educators uh, during the day, and then they go to this, the, the graduate program at night, the master's program at night. And then two of my students who are in the video game scoring minor at Berkeley in the film scoring department in electronic production and design program. And so they're musicians, they're composers, they're sound designers, and um, they're really two, two of my stars. And uh, they've, they've been terrific. Um, both of them uh, showed interests in accessibility. One of them had come up with, uh, in a, just a different course with me, had uh, chosen to do his project on um, a, like a unity project for, uh, to try to um, like simulate what it would be like to be blind. That was, you know, just his idea that, that he did on his own, thinking, oh, virtual reality might be good for that. And so um, he was one of the people I chose to be on this project. And then Courtney, as well, is a very empathetic person who uh, is really interested in helping other people and um, uh, really interested in, in uh, working with children as well, excellent with kids. So, so that's how we gathered our team together. And so the teacher, I went in thinking that we would have um, 
mostly uh, kind of social stories sort of a thing. And um, knowing some of the sort of uh, difficulties that my son had experienced with his music lessons, that uh, some of the things like, um, oh, that if you make a mistake, that that's okay and keep going, which is hard for anybody at all, but can be particularly challenging for uh, this specific population. Or uh, that when we practice music, that we practice um, not always from the top, right, from the very beginning, but, but sometimes just a little piece in the middle and we'll just do that part or we'll pick up from, a, you know, someplace quite towards the end. And that can be challenging as well uh, for, in the way that some people, um, you know, approach things cognitively from the beginning and going all the way through to the end every time. And it's one thing if you're practicing on your own, but once you're working with other musicians who are used to working in a different way, that can be be uh, more challenging. And so those were some of the places I was interested in where kind of the social and the cognitive meet and can be barriers to where a, mus a musician with ASD can um, run into some uh, issues when they're trying to be playing with ensembles, in orchestras, um, in bands, some of those kinds of things, which is when, when I think about where I hope some of these tools can go. Uh, that's where I, I hope that, that this is, uh, you know, these are the kinds of skills I hope that, um, that these will be able to help. The music teachers were saying things like, let me see if we can get to, oh, I'm gonna just go back for a second. Music teachers were saying uh, things like, um, uh, let's work on steady tempo. Let's work on dynamics. So it was really interesting the, the way that, that we had, and so we've been working on all, all of these. So I think, I. So this next one, I need to tell the people in the booth that this, this is um, a really loud, has really loud noises. And so I w would like you, yeah, please to, to, or I could just skip it. What do you think? Would you rather I just skip the thing with loud noises? Or, what are your, or does anyone have any, any strong thoughts? You should do it. Should do it? Okay. Okay. So uh, this is called Too Much Information. And does it, has anyone seen any of these? kind of videos. Yeah, so the idea, this is an example of using 360 video. They say VR, and so it's kind of non-immersive VR. And what, what we have been working with is what level of immersion do we want to use in our program? And there are all kinds of reasons for that. Some people don't like having a headset, right, put on them, that that's, that's uncomfortable, right, for various reasons. Sometimes I don't like having a headset put on me, but I found I found these little <laughs> these little homey dough. Have you, anyone ever used any of these? They're they're basically the lenses that are in Google Cardboard. If you're familiar with Google Cardboard, these are the lenses. So you can just you know well I mean I know you can't see what I am seeing, but you just go like this, and so there's nothing on your head and there's nothing blocking. It's really easy to stop this, right? And if you have on headphones. And, and kind of good headphones, then you can have a, not the same kind of immersive um, experience that you would if you put on like an HTC Vive or an Oculus Rift. And, but um, but it's, it's all right, and it's just so easy, and it's easy to, to carry these, these around, right? <laughs> because that, that's it. And so uh, I bring these to classes and hand them out, collect them back again at the end. And so this has been a really good solution uh, for me. And all that like the Google Cardboard things are is this in some cardboard. So, so I, I got these from, um, I'm from Boston. So we have Micro Center, Do you, is that a, everywhere? Micro, I, I got them from, you can get them online. Um, I got them, uh, I saw that they were on clearance. So I bought all of them in the store. <laughs> that's how I got. That's how I got my kit, my class kit. <laughs> I was like, yes. <laughs> anyway, so I'm gonna play this. Um, this too much information here, and I think I'm gonna play it. I know that's right. Yes. <laughs> I'm not having the best luck with it. Hmm. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna go, uh, oh, oh, that was it, oh, okay. 
No? Okay, well, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, tell you where you can find it for yourself, and um, I'm gonna describe it in a few sentences. And um, it is about a boy who, um, who we see things from, from his first person perspective, and he has a soft toy an animal that he's holding and so you can um, look look uh, with your device and I'll show you on here you can you can look on your device and um, I'm not connected to the internet okay so uh, you can look on your device it's 360 video and his mother is, is having a hard time working on, working to get money out of like the bank machine. And he's looking around, the, he's at a mall, he's looking around the mall and the noises are getting louder and louder for him. And the colors are getting brighter and brighter. And um, the lights, or the fluorescent lights are starting to kind of flicker and flash. And he's really having a scent, like just too much too much information, too much sensory input. And so the noises get bigger and bigger. And uh, it, it puts you in his first person perspective of what that's like. So if you're neurotypical and or you don't have any sensory um, uh, processing uh, experiences like that or you've never had an anxiety attack, I mean, there are all kinds of reasons why or ways in which people might have had an experience that's similar to that that um, you would then have something that is kind of like an experience to, in order to increase uh, empathy. So one of the things that we've been trying to think about is how can we help um, people who are neurotypical understand better what it is like for the student or whomever, the person who they know, their friend, uh, their child, understand, you know, understand better what it's like for them. And there's you know, this idea of autism spectrum, and when people hear spectrum, right, we often think of this, this line. And um, I don't know if anybody has seen this from Theora, this wonderful uh, kind of comic book style, graphic novel style, uh, um, not presentation, but explanation that she's made of what her experience is about what it's like to be, what the autism spectrum is being like. And she says that, you know, that we think of it as, you know, high functioning and low functioning. And uh, people are often, oh, this person's high functioning, low functioning. But really, the spectrum looks more like this. And this is where I want to pivot more towards talking about executive function and cognitive um, accessibility and cognitive uh, issues. Because as you can see up here, you know, autism can affect language, motor skills, perception, executive function, and sensory tolerances. But autism spectrum disorders are highly individualistic that when um, one person, and one person will experience things in, in different ways in different contexts. So someone at home can be very different than the way they are at school, than the way they are in the hallways at school, than the way they are in a private lesson, et cetera, et cetera. So this is the graphic I, I really love because it shows us how um, someone, it's not that someone is high functioning for everything, Right? If they were, then there wouldn't be the traits or the places where they had sort of the disability, where they had the issues with, with um, everyday life. But in fact, that it's this mixed profile, right? And that there are some traits that cause very, can cause pronounced difficulties in everyday life, and then some traits that are very useful or can be very useful in everyday life. So in terms of executive function, when we're thinking about executive function, it, that we define that as um, a family of mental processes that are associated with the functions of the prefrontal cortex, right? So specifically, it is the high level cognitive processes oriented towards, uh, whoop, whoops, okay, here we go, towards um, inhibition, working memory, and shifting, being able to shift from one um, thought, one activity uh, to another. And so we're talking about um, 
uh, reactive inhibition and regulation of goal achievement, goal-oriented achievement behavior. I just want to make sure I'm covering everything I wanted to cover on here. Oh, and so it's essential, of course, for physical and mental health, uh, academic achievement, and cognitive, social, and psychological development. So when we were thinking about, about these here, inhibition, uh, working memory, and by inhibition, you know, sort of the inhibition of um, uh, impulses to do something else, right? The inhibition of, you know, so not, well, anyway. So, Difficulties to, that we thought we could address with immersive tools were, as I was talking about earlier, recital um, unfamiliarity or anxiety and or anxiety. So uh, the students, it's a peculiarity of this situation that the students in the, um, this autism uh, lessons uh, program can't get into the space where they have their recitals before they go to have their recital because of the way that room is booked on Saturdays. The only day that we, it seems like, how can that be? But that just is the way that it is. So when I heard that, I thought, well, th this, is, this is something that we can use you know, technology and media for to preview. And we can create um, VR, first person, kind of like the too much information uh, piece but this time, um, not too much information. Like, you don't have enough information. We're going to give you enough information so that you can preview as many times as you want, or your parents can help you preview as many times as you want. And this is another one of these uh, kinds of um, tools that it would be useful for anybody. I mean, there are so many issues around um, like performance anxiety and uh, stage fright uh, for, for musicians of all kinds that, and going, having to go and play in different spaces that we've never been in before, sure. We are also, we're talking about some of those music specific kinds of things. We came up with 360 degree video, augmented reality, and virtual reality. And then we want, went into this whole idea of, well, what, what's gonna work? I mean, who's gonna wanna put on the headset? And then we moved into a real question about, huh, if students are in their private lessons with their teachers, and here's this connection with their teachers that we recognize as being one of the most important aspects about their developing communication skills, about developing reciprocal relationships, about all kinds of things. You know, here they are, they come in the first week and they're not saying very much, and then we check in, you know, weeks later, and we hear this, uh, I hear this from the people who've worked in this program for years, you know, we check in weeks later, and the student is like talking and laughing with their teacher, and the parents are saying, I, I look at my kid, this is amazing, right? This is what happens here. Um, so we were saying, well, what, what's, you know, how are we gonna do that? So that's why we came up with using more augmented reality than virtual reality. And so we're moving towards iPads, um, I can show you, uh, well, here's the recital preview. Um, I only have a couple minutes, so I'll just show you this. This could be loud too, so in the booth if you can check the sound. Oh, this is, this is not loud. <laughs> this, is, this is super silent, whoops, okay. Actually, okay, so here. And then this is a, a screenshot of an augmented reality um, app about dynamics, so the louder somebody plays, the bigger that ball gets. And um, the idea is to get into uh, a certain zone. And when it's not in the right zone, it's, it's um, a different color, right? So, so we've been working on that as well. So there's been research, and this is uh, only one of the studies that I've been looking at that talk about the relationship between video games and in, in cognitive skills in general and cognitive uh, issues, but in particular around executive functioning because that's one of the important ones for us with this autism project. And this one, a correlation between video game mechanics and executive functions through EEG analysis, um, in particular focused on how specific game mechanics can develop specific cognitive skills. And this chart, um, and I'll, I'll, post, uh, I'll post this um, on Twitter at, at L-O-I-R-L, uh, so you can take a better look at it, um, 
talks about the specific game mechanics that um, can uh, be used to enhance co certain cognitive processes. So this is a good, if you're looking to design, if you're looking to develop for specific cognitive processes. And so I made a chart out of somebody else's research, right? You know, with EEG, which is not the kind of thing I do at all. But that, um, that resource, that study, has all the explanations of what accurate action, timely action, mimic sequence, pattern learning, and logical puzzles are, and then which cognitive skills they were better at uh, doing um, the, the pattern learning and logical puzzles um, were uh, you know, particularly good um, for attention, and then so other ones are better for memory. So that's, the, that's like the shorthand version of if you want to come up with things for uh, you know, increasing or working on um, cognitive uh, cognitive um, skills, that's it. And then, um, with the one, let's see if this will play. Maybe now there's no sound, though. A little bit of sound in the booth? Yeah. Oh, okay, so I'm, I'm just gonna, um, is anyone familiar with, with Autcraft, with Autism Father? Anyone know? So, yeah, so this is, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about this, this project. I know my time's almost up, but to me, this is, this is um, what is so hopeful and so exciting about what we can do right now with games, with uh, virtual worlds. I think Minecraft is the breakout uh, virtual world. The Minecraft generation has expectations for what they, can, they will find in an online platform that is exceptional, right? They expect that they can mod it, that they can modify it. They expect that they can be social in it. They expect that they can access it easily on every platform. They expect that they will be able to um, understand it in a range of modalities. They expect they'll be able to use it whether they can read or not. They expect that they can use it in all of these different ways. They expect they can hook it into other things like Discord and uh, just use it in all of these ways. They can make it, th they expect that it's theirs, right? And that is what a virtual world is. It's, some, it's a place that is the people who are in it and who are making it. And so, you know, get ready for Ready Player One, right? That's coming out in just a few weeks. And if you think people are talking about virtual reality now, just wait. <laughs> people are going to be talking about it. And this is the time when everybody is going to be, not everybody, but a lot of people and the culture is going to be focusing on what is VR, what are virtual worlds, what are we doing with this? There's going to be, oh, it's dangerous. Everyone's just going to sit in their room and the pathologi you know, pathologize it. And there's some serious concerns, of course, there always are. But there also are so many amazing benefits. And what, what Stuart Duncan did with Autcraft is he noticed that you know, his, his child with autism wanted to play Minecraft, but there were people who were mean on these servers. And oh, there are people who are mean on these servers and in games, so toxic, right? So he decided he was going to make his own server and he did, and he put up a little tiny notice saying, does anyone want to be on this nice server for autism? That's not what he said, but something like that. You can watch his TED talk, watch the whole thing. I had a little excerpt, but you should just you know, watch, watch and, and, and you can read the transcript, fantastic. And he said, what he said is what people, what the kids did in it was amazing. There were kids who first they were misspelling things, but then they saw people spelling them correctly and, and they learned. There were kids who parents were saying, my, my kid doesn't talk, but my kid is talking when he plays or she plays Autcraft. There were emergent cognitive skills. And that's the secret, I think, or not the secret, but that's the key to how to think about accessibility. To think about how do we create accessibility so people can become as wonderful as they possibly can. There's always potential. There are always ways in which we can, um, in the title of my, my GDC talk later, dial down some of the inputs and the barriers so that people can have greater access to themselves. We can change the environment. We can create filters for games. We can create augmentation 
for uh, what is going to be in our actual world and in our virtual world so that people can modify their situation so there is not too much information. Thank you very much.